know from laboratory tests in the next couple of weeks just how effective the, the vaccines are against this, this variant. If we need to manufacture a Omicron specific variant, it's going to take some weeks, you know, two to three months is probably what we're looking at. Moderna's chief medical officer, Dr. Paul Burton, Raywat Dionandin is with the University of Ottawa, he's an epidemiologist, and he starts us off live at 3.07 on 680 CJOB. Good to talk to you again, thanks for joining us. Is there a sense here that uh, in the hours uh, today, we're starting to learn more about this? Or are we still in a wait and hold for all the data to come in? I think we're still in a wait and hold. And there are two kinds of data to wait for, the laboratory data and the epidemiological data. The laboratory data tells us things like how effective the vaccine likely is based upon the antibody response and how many mutations are on it. And the epidemiology tells us probably um, how protective the vaccine is at the population level and how serious it is in terms of how many people it ends up uh, hospitalizing. Any hints as to where this is all going at this point? <laughs> it really is truly to know. But if you look at in South Africa, there is an incredible acceleration of infections. And that might be due to Delta or it might be due to Omicron. It's probably due to Omicron, frankly. We also saw a dramatic increase in hospitalizations. Now, does that mean it's more dangerous? It might not be. That just might be the, the result of having more cases in the same proportion end up hospitalized. Keep in mind that South Africa has a very low vaccination rate, so we can conclude very little about the vaccine efficacy from this. That's right. And I think that was sort of the information that I was reading over the weekend was like, hey, hey, remember, some of these places only have a vaccination rate of 23 percent, which is low. And yeah, when you have a lot more people infected just by the by the numbers, more people could wind up in hospital. But we were hearing at, at least anecdotally that the symptoms maybe weren't more severe, in fact, may have been milder than than some cases. So it's it is really still guesswork here. And we really have to rely on people that are are seeing it first hand. That's exactly right. That's way too early to tell. And frankly, we've seen other variants emerge over the course of the year. Um, Mu was one of them that was scary and it didn't go anywhere because Delta held it at bay. This could be that scenario. Frankly, probably isn't. It looks so hypertransmissible. It probably is a, a real threat in terms of hypertransmissibility. It doesn't necessarily mean it's more serious. Let's wait and see. So is it important to see what we are seeing in terms of listening to people that are trying to to get to get out of South Africa, to get out of some of these other countries that are, are seeing it happen? Is that the right approach to kind of lock countries down again? Yeah. Or by the time that we find out about it, is the horse already out of the barn? It's a good question. Uh, we, we already have cases in Canada, so there is an argument that it's too late. However, I think numbers do matter, and you don't want to introduce new seating events at airports around the country. I don't necessarily think banning flights from certain countries is going to help because you can always come through different countries and there are no, there are very few direct flights from South Africa to Canada, for example. Most go through Europe or the USA. What we need, I think, is better testing at the border. So incoming people probably should get a PCR test at this point and we have to up our genomic surveillance capacity so that all tests are screened for this uh, variant and apply contact tracing to incoming travelers. Stuff we know that needs to be done because we've been through this before with Alpha and Delta. We just gotta make sure we do it well this time. With Rewa Dionandon from the University of Ottawa, Richard and Julie with you on 680 CJOB. Let's elaborate on that because you talk about PCR testing, explain the effectiveness of that, what we're doing right now as opposed to what we should be doing in your view. Well, I'm not entirely clear what we're doing right now. I, I thought we had stopped testing incoming travelers from certain countries, and maybe we have, maybe we haven't. But I think uh, people should be presenting a negative PCR test when they arrive, and even so, they should probably self-isolate for a few days while we wait the results of those PCR tests, and we need to be able to contact trace vigorously, vigorously. If this thing is as hypertransmissible as some people claim, then you know many people on board a flight might be becoming infected and not showing symptoms until they get home. So we need to apply our public health assets focusedly, that's a word, focusedly, on uh, the travel sector. Ontario, again, two cases there. Quebec is saying that there's a case. Manitoba coming out saying no cases here as of yet. So it appears that uh, the surveillance is underway we've learned from what we have done in the past that we're not waiting and we're actually doing 
uh, what needs to be done at this point, but one wonders whether it's enough. Well, um, the good news is that this new variant resembles the alpha variant in some ways, and so we have the capacity to detect alpha using a similar approach, so we just pivot and use that approach to detect Omicron. And we have a better genomic surveillance infrastructure now than we did in the past, so we have that ability. And look, it's entirely possible that our vaccines are working well against this, and so we won't see good penetration of this variant into our well-vaccinated well communities. That might be the case. And if we do, maybe the breakthrough infections are mild. We don't know. That's entirely possible still. Is it important, um, and this is something the World Health Organization was talking about today, to acknowledge uh, South Africa and Botswana for identifying and sequencing this. And, and important to note, it says that it may not have originated there. They just happened to be the one to identify it and, and are encouraging others not to, to poke the finger of blame, saying this originated in your country or that country so that other countries, if they do see something happening, will be more forthcoming and transparent in providing that information. It's a really good point. We can't be stigmatizing countries and penalizing them for being transparent and for being good scientists. All we do is encourage them to be silent when new problems arise. We don't want that scenario at all. This is a human problem. This is not the problem of a specific country. And we solve this at the human level, at the species level, which is why I'm calling for a, a focused all hands on deck global approach to solving COVID. Manufacturing vaccines at an enormous pace, distributing uh, N95 respirators around the world, do everything we can to stop this thing now so that we don't have to deal with this for years. Is it important, or, or is it, I guess the question is, are these variants popping up as a result of large populations of unvaccinated people? And if that's the case, why? Well, the prevailing theory is that these variants arise when transmission happens because variants are the result of random mutation eventually stumbling upon a version that is advantageous for the virus. So the more opportunity for reproduction, the more likely you'll get one of these advantageous viruses. And so the more people being infected, that's more laboratories for the virus. And, and the more people being infected means more unvaccinated people because unvaccinated people Again, unvaccinated people are more likely to be infected. There is a school of thought that holds that that's particularly true for immunocompromised people who can hold infection for longer periods of time, like um, you know, cancer patients or HIV uh, patients, for example, and they are more likely to be variant farms. That's a controversial statement. I'm not a virologist, I can't say for sure, but that is one narrative that's emerging. Overall, as you wake up today after watching some of this unfold over the weekend, um, do you change any of your predictions about what happens going forward in terms of how many waves we have? And, and you know, obviously we're all done with it, but it's not done with us. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, this was not the nightmare scenario, but a concerning scenario that the experts were considering. Our, our highway off of this roller coaster ride, mixing metaphors, was vaccination and the one big roadblock was a new variant arising that threatened vaccine escape as it's called this might be that variant it might not be if it is a variant that really threatens vaccine efficacy then yeah we're in for a longer ride than we thought if it isn't then okay the plan remains the same vaccinate everybody quickly and we get out of this faster well, only time will tell, and it could be a, a difficult couple of weeks until we get some of those answers. Thanks for trying to provide us with some <laughs> answers. Radio Nandan is from the University of Ottawa. He